Jeez, we hope you will. Oh, there you go. We try to have you know, lunch time. That always increases attendance. Right. We'll do, I'm just going to do a quick sound check. Hopefully you can hear and also see the screen. I'll send a quick chat so that you can confirm. And we'll get started very soon. I know. I Right. Just going to do a quick sound check again. Let me know if you can't hear for some reason. I see one person saying they're having a difficult time hearing. Can you hear us now that we're talking? It might have been earlier we weren't really speaking. Was that any better? Still silent. Okay. Hello. Hi. 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 Come on in. There's some food in the back. Cool. It's really cool. Wow. It's a good idea. Okay, I'm doing a quick test again on sound. Still silent? Turning up the volume as much as I can. Hmm. There are three other callers on the call. Okay, how's this for sound? Can anybody hear us now? Just making sure. I'm talking to people online. Anna, just a quick sound check if you're can you hear us? It's possible you've got us muted on your end, I'm wondering. I had you as a user 
muted, but can you hear us? And then my question would be to everyone else who's online, can you hear? You're about to get started and I want to make sure that you're able to hear. Okay, folks who are joining us online, we'll be starting in just another moment here. Just conducting a quick sound check for those online. Can you please hear? Hi, Karina. This is Joyce. Joyce, this is Karina, who works in our counseling department. Please grab some food. Hmm. All right, Anna, I'm really sorry. I don't know what's happening with the call here. We'll go ahead and get started just to kind of respect time and give enough time to have questions. I'm going to leave the door open just because we have some here right now. I'm hoping with, with a little bit of uh, a few vibes in here, I'm getting some going well, we'll be able to go. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Vice Chair and Managed Career Services. This is an event part of our series and licensure week. We have some folks joining us online as well. We're very lucky today to have George Marder with us. Who will, is with uh, Urban Downs, but also is the president of the Illinois Mental Health Counselor Association. I'll be at the podium handling some questions and helping her through sort of the PowerPoint so that she can spend some time with you. There are some handouts. For those of you online, we'll certainly try to get electronic copies that we can share. The session is being recorded, so if you have peers that couldn't join us, hopefully we'll get this online next week after all the licensure week events have passed. We hope you'll also consider joining us tomorrow evening from 5 to 7 p.m. In the same room, I believe, we're going to have a panel of folks who have had kind of gone through some of their processes as well. So at least a little bit about the LTC, LTPC, uh, BCBA, and then also clinical psychologists. So if you have a chance tomorrow, come for a little bit or uh, as much of it as you can. Thank you for your support. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joyce. And I'll, I'll be happy to be up here and be your okay, great guide. And I'll we will ask tomorrow because we have a panel. Sometimes we need to ask each person, but as long as the panelists say yes, which they usually do, they're all alumni. If I think they will, we'll be glad to do that. So, all right. Okay, with that, here we go. Joy, thank you a lot. You're welcome. So, um, thank you for having me here today. As I said, my name is Joyce Marr, and I have been a licensed clinical professional counselor since 1998. So, it was 18 years ago that I was in your shoes, and waiting to finish up my last few weeks in my graduate program, I finished at the, uh, I studied at Northwestern in our counseling site. And I remember feeling very nervous and very overwhelmed and anxious about the whole licensure process, which always seems to be changing. In the year that I was in it, um, I was grandfathered in. It was the last year that you didn't have to get the LCPC before getting an LCPC. 
I'm sorry, the LPC before getting the LPC. So it's been a long time, but I'm happy to be here and talk with you. And congratulations on being at this point in your program. How are you all feeling and doing today? I hope all is cold. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about my journey and about uh, the work that I'm doing today, and then I'm going to be talking to you about licensure and also about job search and answering any questions that you might have. So first of all, I just would like to say that, I, you know, again, congratulations at being at this point in your career because it's so exciting. I really am so grateful to this field. I always say that it's given me a language and a lens through which to understand myself and my life and the world around me. And the work in this field is so rewarding. Um, I really feel like it's, it's emotionally and fleshly and even spiritually rewarding. And there's so many different types of work that we can do within this field. And that's one of the things that I've really appreciated now that I've been in it for 20 years, that I've done so many different things throughout my profession. And it, it can be really dynamic and enriching. And uh, I've really, really appreciated that. So when I first graduated uh, from my master's program, the first job that I got was at Family Guidance Center, which was in substance abuse. And the reason that I chose that was because I was interested in learning more about that because it wasn't something that I learned a lot about in my master's program. And I knew that I was interested in working in private practice at some point. And I later was interested in employee assistance program work. How many of you have heard of EAP work? I, I liked the idea of being in a more corporate or business setting. And I knew, knew that I needed substance abuse experience to work in that type of environment. And so I worked at Family Violence Center for a couple of years. And then I worked in EAP for five years. And I really recommend that work experience. I found it really enriching. I learned a lot about diagnosis, assessment, and brief treatment. So basically, an EAP provides brief counseling services, assessment, brief treatment, and referral to employees and family members of client companies uh, that work with their organization program. And so I had the opportunity to counsel people and also to give presentations and workshops at client companies, and it was a really enriching professional experience. I also had been interested in private practice, and I started a private practice in 1998, and um, I had joined a group practice and learned how to do marketing on my own, I'm very interested in that. And I really enjoy working with individual adults and couples. Hello, welcome. Hi. And uh, I came to found Urban Balance, which today has grown to a counseling practice that has six locations and almost 70 therapists on staff. So it's become a really large organization in the last 10 years. We actually have become the home of an intern of a, a Chicago professional school. Uh, student, which is great, and we're an insurance friendly counseling practice. I bought a brochure for you guys to check that out. And we do hire LCC, so if you or somebody that you know is interested in a part time private practice job, we can provide provision for that. And uh, it's a great adjunct to another job at a community mental health center or, or some other uh, program or agency. So that's something else that you can think about or ask me about if I can be a resource to you. Um, but the point of telling you all of this is that through my career, I've done many different things. I've worked with individuals, couples, families, with depression, anxiety, addiction, relationship issues. I have been a presenter for workplaces, a therapist. I have um, written, I've become a blogger for the Huffington Post and for Psych Central. Um, I have a book in development. There's a million different things that you can do with this degree and with this life. So it's really exciting and you'll, you'll never get burned out. There's so many different opportunities and you can reinvent yourself and 
that's something that I really appreciate. Another aspect of this career that I really value and the reason that I need to set up this urban balance is that you can have work-life balance in this career. I'm a mom. I have two daughters who are 9 and 12. And I make it my goal to work school hours so that I can be with them in the morning and the evening. And that has been something I've been able to do within this field. And I'm really grateful to the field for that flexibility. Um, so that's something else that I think is unique to our profession, that you really can have a successful career and also have work-life balance. And something else that I'd like to say to you um, that I just want to share with you is that sometimes people say, yeah, you certainly don't go into counseling for the money. And that actually bothers me because I really believe that you can be financially successful at anything that you're passionate about. And I believe in the, uh, the idea of opening yourself up to prosperity. And if you believe that you can be successful in whatever you do, you will be. So I encourage you to aim high and know that you're worth being able to make a nice income for yourself and that you will have financial success if you believe in yourself. And I encourage you um, to maintain that, that way of thinking. So in the last few years, I have become a part of the board of Incut. How many of you are familiar with Incut, the Illinois Mental Health Counselor Association? Okay, good. I honestly didn't know that much about Incut. I first learned about it when I took my test to be an LCPC because they have this great preparatory class for the life insurance exam which I highly recommend. Uh, those are really, really great. It's just going to decrease your anxiety tremendously uh, when you get ready to take your exam. I could recommend them more highly. <laughs> in fact, Graham Giordano is still teaching the class, and she, she taught it back in 1996 when I took it. So she, she knows a lot. She's been teaching it a long, long time. And the test is you know, really like any standardized class, it's not measuring how great of a clinician you are, it's just helping you pass the exam. So I do encourage you to take advantage of that. And I didn't know a lot about INCOT, and I went through my professor for 15 years really not utilizing the benefit of the professional association. And then about three years ago, I was approached by Gary Stone, who was serving as the president of MCOT. And she asked me if I would host in a networking event at Urban Balance. And I said, sure, no problem. And then she asked if I'd be interested in serving on the board. And I said that I was interested in that. And it turned out that my membership had, had laughed, which I was embarrassed about. And they said, well, we'd love to have you on the board for the better choice. We So I did that. And it really was one of the best professional decisions I've ever made. And the reason for that is because the Illinois Mental Health Counselors Association is the number one organization that advocates for our life in Illinois. Um, so for the LCC and the LCPC, which I'm going to be talking to you about today, IMSA is the organization that advocates for it. It didn't always exist. When I started my, my graduate program, it was brand thinking new. I was thinking I was going to have to go on and become a, a psychologist in order to obtain a license in which I could practice independently. And it was input that advocated for the license to come into existence. And every few years, it's up for renewal. And in Pilates at Springfield, to make sure that the license gets free credentials. And it's really, really, really important that we all join in cut and support the organization. So if you are not a member, I strongly encourage you to take one of these applications. And I know graduate students and you know um, recently graduated people have a lot of money that they can get it fast because there's also a job search part of the organization where they have job postings, they're networking with them. It's a great way to meet other professionals. Uh, I strongly encourage you to 
get involved in the organization. And so anyway, I've been serving on the board for the last three years. The first year I served as the membership chair, then I was the vice president, and this year I'm serving as the president. IMCOT is the is an organization that is um, ICA is the parent organization. So ICA is the Illinois Counseling Organization. And that serves all different kinds of counseling professions. So there are other branches like school counselors and, and that type of thing. Um, so anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the licensure and then we'll circle back to answering questions that you have about about the um, about the job search process, and et cetera. So mental health licenses in Illinois, we have the LPC, the Licensed Professional Counselor, and the LPPC, which is the Licensed Clinical Professional Counselor. So obviously the LPC is the limited license to practice, which you are all eligible for upon graduation. And the LPPC is the one that requires the supervised experience that typically takes two years of full-time supervised experience. And there are two separate tests and two separate applications, so you want to make sure that you are selecting the correct one when you're moving through that process. And the next slide we have is we'd like to show you the video for ICA. This is a public service announcement that the Illinois Counseling Association put together. And it just tells you a little bit about what the counselors are doing in Illinois. Oh. Refresh it. It actually played the numbers. Maybe I have too many numbers. Let me try it. Just a little bit. Of... I'm just kidding. I already just heard you say that it's more beneficial to be a member of ICA than ACA. That's a good question. I, I would think so. I would think so. I would say, personally, I would think so. If you're going to meet people and like get involved and keep the kind of local conferences and training and get connected. I think networking is such an important part of career development in this field. And I always tell people at, at your point in your professional development, two things are really important. One is to look at your first job out of graduate school as an extension of your clinical training. So it's not like your be all and all career. My first job out of graduate school, I was working at a methadone agency program, but, you know, the substance use That isn't what I imagined I'd be doing for the rest of my life. It was a great experience. I learned a tremendous amount. I'm really grateful for that experience. I got great supervision. Um, so it's a stepping stone. You look for good supervision and comprehensive experience. And to be really open-minded. I also tell people, you don't need to look for a specialization in my life. Because sometimes people are excited to identify their niche. And really what employers look for is comprehensive experience. Like for example, when Urban Down was looking kind of clinicians, we look for people who have experience, individuals, couples, families, with longer term experience, have they experience a crisis, do they have experience with substance abuse classes. So it's really looking for rich clinical experience. They can be the mental health centers are great places to get those, those first couple of years of experience. Uh, hospitals are also great places to work. Um, I also think it's really important to find a mentor. So in, in my own experience, I worked at a group practice where I had a consultant who I really liked. And I eventually paid him myself to provide me with supervision. And then I just asked him about my career and started my own private practice. And he's still my consultant. And I still seek help from him as needed. And I think that mentorship is really something that's really important. Um, so ICA or ACA is great. I think that's important. But if you're looking at where to spend your dollars, I would I would say join 
IPA and then select input as your your branch that you're you're picking. Uh, and you really get involved. You, get, you can serve on the board even though you're fresh out of school. Um, you can get involved, you can volunteer at conferences, you can there's all different ways to meet people and the more that you <coughs> network and meet people, the better job prospects you're gonna have. Have you guys started interviewing or looking for positions? How has that been going so far? The one person who wants to talk about doing
and there's an Impact Facebook page and Impact Twitter as well, and same with I ICA. Um, there's also other job resources. I mean, I think just really um, the more networking that you can do. I was just telling I said that yesterday I was at NASA for looking at the Northern Illinois Employee Assistance Professionals Association. They have a website and they have chapter meetings. And I know someone that got a job simply by attending a chapter meeting, standing up at the end and saying, I'm looking for a job. So, you know, you kind of have to learn how to speak up for yourself. Uh, one of my favorite examples about that was um, with my private practice, um, when I was new at it, I, um, they call it an elevator pitch, like, you know, that 30 second telling someone who you are, what to do. You're going to have to come up with your elevator pitch Hi, and graduate from, you know, have my master's and explaining what you're looking for, what you want to do, getting that down so you can tell people, do you know anyone? You know, I, I love an informational interview being open to volunteering, that type of thing. But my favorite um, elevator pitch story was uh, one time I went to get a free makeover with a, a girlfriend of mine at Max. And the makeup artist said, uh, what do you do for a living? And I was practicing my elevator pitch. And so I thought, well, I'll just practice it on her. And she's like, well, I'm a therapist in private practice. And I just started to go in an office. And she said, oh, my gosh, my my best friend's a psychiatrist, and she just opened an office to write all you. And I said, oh, really? And I said, I'd love to meet her, and I handed her my card. And that was um, 12 years ago, and that psychiatrist did call me for coffee. And um, she, when we met, she said, um, we, we hit off, and I was pregnant, and I was explaining that I was leaving my EAP job, and I was really nervous about it going into private practice on my own. And she said, don't worry about it. I'll just sell your practice when you come back. And I came back from leave. She literally gave me 20 clients. And we've been friends ever since. And we've referred hundreds of people. And it came from one conversation with me about it. So just telling everyone you meet, <laughs> like, hi, I'm a counselor. This is what I'm interested in. And the more friendly and nice you are, um, the more people are going to be interested in helping you and being willing to volunteer. Um, there was one woman who works for Urban Mount now. Um, her, her name is Leslie Holly. Um, she, she came to me through a, a colleague of mine who I really adore and that, she, that colleague was mentoring her and, and asking if I'd be willing to speak with Leslie. And I did. And Leslie was interested in working at Urban Mount, but she had far less work experience than we would normally look at. And so I said, you know, gosh, I really like you, but it's really not fit. And she said, well, could I volunteer? I'd be happy to help you with anything. I have eight hours a week that I do like to give to you. And I said, well, you know, would you be willing to help with some odds and then marketing with my employees? She said, whatever I can do. And she did such a great job. People were commenting on how nice she was, how special she was, that within two months we hired her. And we just, I ended up giving her an extra budget for training and supervision so that we could bring her up to where she needed to be. Um, but really being nice and friendly goes a long way and professional. Um, so really thinking about that, I think it's important. Um, how are you feeling about, maybe we can just get the video and then just, yeah, the video really is just, it's just kind of a general overview. It's just a general overview of something happening in Illinois just kind of brings awareness um, to the general public about what counselors do. Um, but I think, yeah, we can just go back to the PowerPoint. So I think it's just helpful. So, I spoke with Sam Stacy before I came here today. Sam is the executive director of Intel. He's really knowledgeable. And if you're an income member, you can call him with any question that you have about life insurance or any issue that you're having. 
and he is the one with the wealth of information. And um, when I talked to him about this presentation, which he put together, he said, oh, he said the Chicago School, they're really great about making sure that their students take the right classes to be prepared for life insurance. So you guys should be in good shape about your classes. So move on to the next one. Um, so in terms of your experience, um, do you have any questions about the experience that's required of you in order to get your um, your degree? I mean, I'm sorry, your your license. There's no experience required for the LPC, so you guys are ready to go for that. And then in terms of your LCPC, there's there on the MPA website there is there's these flow charts that kind of explain what experience you need. Um, the MCO website, oh, I think we have those there. Those are, those are really helpful. Um, so you can see, you know, what experience counts. One thing that's really important is that if you work in a private practice setting, you must be supervised and you must be paid as a W-2 employee. Um, those are really important things. Um, so it's in order for your hours to account. So all of that information really is in front of you and is accessible on the website. So you can move on to the next one. So your exam is the MC National Counselor Examination, 200 multiple choice questions are factual, um, the MCM, HP, um, you know, again, more questions, effective treatment planning scenarios, example. Um, next slide. Exams are offered for the first two weeks um, of every month at specific HR block offices. And you can do offer it here. Right. So some of you may have taken the exam in April. Some of you might be thinking about taking the exam in October on campus. If you are graduating in the next couple of months or have graduated within the last year, you have the option to take it on campus not required if you chose not to or you didn't feel like it at that time, you can still go through the standard process. The order is just reversed. So if you chose to take the exam first before you completed your degree, you will still need to apply for your license. There's a couple steps you'll need to take with uh, NBCC to release your material. You'll still apply to the state as is with the examination in a minute. And if you didn't take the exam, you just apply to the state, which we'll get to in a minute, and then you'll be authorized to take the exam through an HR block location. And if you have an open for that, you're talking about the NCC. National Council. Yeah. Students are not eligible to take the clinical one, right? Right. No, just for the Exactly. Exactly. So the standard process, if you have not taken the exam, is now going to kind of cover your head. Yeah. So this is the standard process. Who has, who has not taken the exam? Yeah. Okay. How are you feeling about it? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. No, no worries. And we'll do two after the session because if you signed in, either online or in person, we'll send you the slides just so you have them and you don't have to. But again, uh, and Charles and I are always available to kind of refresh. We usually uh, are grateful enough to get somebody from MCA in, but then we can always fill in the blank as you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you complete the application with IDSCR, $150 charge, six to eight weeks. Upon hearing back from IDSCR, complete the application with NBCC, $195 one or two weeks. Um, complete the application with Compton, costing $98. Take the optional test prep workshop for this cost. Have any of you taken that? Yeah. It's only for the clinical. Yeah, and most people think it because what ends up happening is we recommend that they take their exam pretty close to their degree. Yeah, and Dan's always kind of suggesting too that if you take your exam pretty close, either while you're in the program or as you finish, you're more likely to pass with the NCE. But because the NCMAC is a few years out, you've been working. That often people have found the that workshop is for and but that's really really great. It's so important, and this task is different. It's a it's a weird yeah. task. It's a, it's an odd task. Yeah. And it does seem like this year more people are graduating with their LCC, like the, the gap. The exam. The exam. Yeah. 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 yeah, the gap is much less yeah. than it has been in recent years. 
So sometimes what people would do is they would push off the exam because they're graduating, they're job searching, and so people would wait a lot longer. We're really trying, one of the reasons we have this week and other events, we're really trying to recommend that you keep it as close together. We find that the, the percentage of passing is much higher, and hopefully that also helps you become more marketable with employers. You can say, I've recently taken the exam, or I'm about to take the exam. They feel better, too. They feel as if you're more likely to get it more, you know, a little more quickly as well. So it's more confidence and fire out and all of that. Only Chicago Counseling in the master's program are eligible for that option. Okay. Um, so other layers of your fundamental from study program that you have to wait until after you get your degree. The master's must be conferred and you must meet all of the courses necessary for counseling licensure. Okay, so then after that, I actually get it at the end of the summer instead of all yes. the application and then they let me know if I can take it. You got it. The one difference too, I'll just point out because it does come up, is when you take the exam at an HR block location, you're taking it at a computer, and you do get your results right away. But the state, it's uh, just like the other process, you have to wait until you receive the license to be actually considered licensed. But you'll know how you did, whereas some of you may have to wait for the scores to be mailed to you with the application, the other application. So all our master's degree months have been written. Um, and then some people are working towards their doctorate degree, but have their master's degree and are interested in their LCC. Does anybody here feel like it might end up in that situation? So in that situation, um, Sam Stacy was saying you can't, you can't count your hours twice. Um, so you, you either count them, you know, once towards the LCPC when you take it after your master's or you wait and you take it after your doctorate. So um, I guess half the number of hours are needed for the doctorate or needed for a master's level person. Um, that makes sense. So I know sometimes I have that at Urban Down so somebody has their they're working on their doctorate because they work with Urban Downs part time and they want to get that LCPC so that they can get paid more. Um, so in that case, you kind of cash it in your hour to get that license. And again, Dan can answer any of these questions if you join in how much I encourage you to. Um, work experience for LCPC, um, nothing different because you're an almost doctor's degree. Um, <laughs> If you have a clinical master's degree, um, you can count internship hours as a experience, which is great. So you think you can't go through hours for the master's all the time to stop it? No. Yeah. What's going to happen is completed clinical degree, but I think it's different than along the way. So along the way, you have had internship and practicum hours, which they will accept up to a point. But if you're applying at the base and at the end of your degree, it's something to think about. It's something that I think is really individual. You have to figure out when you're applying for the ECCP versus if you want the LCPC. Now, if there's going to be a year or two with an LCPC prior to the ECCP, it's probably in your favor. But I think it's something that requires a little bit of a deeper conversation just to see. We're happy to have that conversation. And Dan is really good at yeah. looking at the distinctions. I know I've talked about that with other people. But it's something to just keep in mind that you can use some of your interest in the practicum hours towards the LCPC along the way. And then, of course, at the end of your site, you need to help me in terms of making the decision there. Okay. You can work outside the United States. Does anybody think about doing that or working outside the U.S.? You can do that as long as you're supervised. Yeah. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're supervised and how much provision goes to the United And they just look at it as similar levels of supervision. So in Illinois, LCPC, LCSW, like clinical psychologist, or psychiatrist. So it has to be sort of similarly. Some countries don't have the same clinical supervision title or, or credential, but so long as they meet a similar criteria, then you may submit to work. You don't have to live in Illinois to go for the process, which is sort of an interesting thing for some of us. Yeah. yeah. 
um, work experience, Dan has had a lot of people ask if there are forms to prove provision. Because once you get the application, um, then there's an a area where the supervisor kind of fills in. And I, I filled out a resilience of these over here. And um, people have sometimes multiple supervisors from different sites. And Dan recommends that you really create your own form. It doesn't have to be rocket science. You can do it in Excel or do it in Word and just say, you know, I started on this day and I worked, you know, this many number of hours per week and I have supervision, you know, this many hours per week and have your supervisor sign off on it, you know, periodically. Um, this made me laugh when you wrote that supervisor can vanish, die, or retire. Um, which you know, a little bit morbid, but um, but I, I am surprised that like now I'll have people for ten years ago go, Hi, remember me? I work i now that I'm in California and I worked for you twelve years ago and I need you to verify that I worked for you this period of time. And it's kind of a hassle. So stay on top of it before you leave an internship or a job, have somebody sign off on it so you're not trying to chase down that person because you might lose them. And Dan thought he gets called every day from supervisors who are like mad as a former supervisee and he's going to sign off, which is not ethical. Um, so just stay on top of it and make sure that you're getting that signed off on so that you have your ducks in a row when it comes to that information. One recommendation that some employers and Dan have suggested in the past as well, something to think about. The documentation for the LPC or the LCP to the actual application changes from time to time, but not that frequently. If you print the supervisor form, we've had organizations that will actually sign off. Now, it's up to you to maintain that, right? I mean, if you're going to leave an organization or whatnot, but it might also help you stay on good terms and also hopefully have that. So you can have multiple verification forms from all of your supervisors that total up to what you need. So it's not a bad practice to sort of get into that. You all have been doing this anyway with your assistant practice on through time to track. Some people purchase that, but really it's a simple thing that you create that you're just going to manage lifelong the nature of sort of not that supervision, but your hours in general, you're going to be And this is a silly side note, but in terms of maintaining the relationship, I can tell you how small this world is. Um, now that I'm 20 years into practicing in Chicago, it's a world. And I, at this point, am very grateful that I have not grown gorgeous. You know, and, and so being, you know, if you're losing a job or an internship or you have a difficult relationship with a supervisor, just really working at handling yourself especially and getting that to the best of your ability um, is going to help you down the road. People can kind of change positions and organizations and you're going to see them again. Um, so I just want to share that with you. So an LPC can work in a government setting, a nonprofit setting, can be an employee of a private practice, but cannot act independently or have their own private practice. So sometimes people think that they can have their own private practice, but you cannot tell you that your LPC. You have to work under the supervision of somebody else. So working for an urban balance or some other licensed clinician. And you just when they this point always comes up as an employee it means you cannot be on a contract. You actually have to be a part time or a full time employee of that organization. It's something that most organizations should themselves be aware, but it, it you know, just keep that in mind. And then again you can get supervision on site, which is a really, really unique and hopefully you don't need to, but it's something that is a unique feature I think for Illinois. Yeah. So LCPs can practice independently, start their own private practice, and can play an LCP. And again, I just love this credential and love I think we're really fortunate and you can make a good living you really can't be in this one this life for sure. Um, so continuing education requirements are 30 CPs are required every two years for those RCPs education units, and you get those by attending workshops and conferences and some of those you obtained online as well. Um, and they are from approved providers like um, ISCA and INCA and ICA, the Illinois School Counselor Association. And this 
chick I was for is an absolute provider as well for the master's level, so you'll continue to the event as alumni, you're more than welcome. Okay. And yeah, so that's another nice thing. And then the final thing I'll say is that first renewal, you don't need the CEs, but you will need them following that. So you're kind of keeping that in mind as well. And ACA has a new version of the Code of Ethics that's available online if you're interested in checking that out. Um, Sam said that the, the main thing that's changed is um, something regarding seed splitting, but it's different than it is in Illinois, so it's a little confusing. If you're interested in reading more about that, so let's look that up. The Sam is having its annual conference in March on the 6th, 7th, and 8th of 2015. If you're interested in attending that and, and getting so much of the news, you This is another, this is a really lame YouTube video that I made with Leslie Howe that I mentioned earlier. So it's a, the technology is really, well, there's Leslie, um, but we're talking about in class so we can see if it works. I'm going to start it over. Sorry. <laughs> All right, here we go. Organizations are a good place to look for jobs. 
shot as well. Um, if it, they don't market as much for them and um, they receive fewer applicants. So, you know, that makes a difference as well. Um, I think also we're looking for a job. Networking is important, important even um, offering some here and and if you have a chance to meet with someone to ask for an informational interview, so if you're not hiring, just asking them about their organization. And one, one thing that I've learned is that if you know, really to think about how you can help them rather than what they can give to you. And for example, I had a graduate student who said, to me, if your company doesn't have an internal newsletter, I think that that would really help your communication with your staff. And is that something that I can help you with? And I was like, you're such a great job. I love that. And, and um, so anyway, I ended up hiring to help with the dad. She was about to turn to her with that. But that's an example of like showing people what you can offer. Um, and it, it just shows your value rather than your belief or something. Any questions about the interviewing process or or what that might be like. The next offer is that. We both positions do on career hunt, so you can look at as organizations like yours or others have a need to read for them. So it's a nice resource for them and then also for you all to be able to access. Uh, you know, is it beneficial to get your LPC experience in the Wisconsin is very similar. Michigan is a little bit different. Um, the issue that you'll need to think about any time you get licensed is what the terminal license in that state is usually in counseling. So, I mean, I usually suggest looking at each state and then getting a sense of it. Most states, and there's no reciprocity among states, but some states recognize, like your exam scores, for instance, likely apply to something like, for, and NCE would apply to about 41 states, the NCMAC is for the balance. So it just kind of depends. Some states still won't consider you licensed unless you've had that license for a period of time. That's the other thing to think about. So they might give you a wave on one step of the process if you've been licensed as an LPT in Illinois for five years, maybe, right? Then they'll say, okay, we'll let you skip these steps. You still need to apply. You still need to send us all the materials, but we'll give you a pass on some of these things. So it's not entirely reciprocal, but there's sort of some recognition of that license in another state. So it's really important that you just become good at, because, you know, in reality, if you don't know today from 10 years from now, you might move, but just get good at understanding how to read or review the application material. And things change. So even if you're thinking, okay, in two years I might end up there, this company could change their rules or Michigan could change their rules. Michigan is a little bit unique in some ways, but most folks have, with your, with a clinical ID, you, you end up in one category, but then they also have a master's level psychologist. I think that a lot of our counseling folks get. There's a few different options to kind of think through. Um, some states, that we are pretty good at accommodating the basic counseling criteria across the country, but some states have a unique thing. So Florida asks for a human sexuality course. Michigan asks for a consulting course, right? So you have to figure out, have you taken that? Can I get that in some way? So there's just things to pay attention to. Because it's been so nice to work for Sunday at the same time. Oh, portability. Yeah. Yeah, go, right? Yeah. yeah. That would make life really nice. Other questions? Hi. I had a question. Oh. Sure. Go right ahead. OK. Um, one of the things, and I, I know I might have come late, so I might have missed this part. I am currently um, trying to get a postdoc where I was asked if I could try to obtain my LCPC um, as soon as possible. Now, I will confer my CID by this September. That's when I'm done with my internship. Interestingly enough, I did a second internship prior to the one that I'm completing now. I wanted to know if with those two internships that I've completed, do you think that that would count as the professional hours that I would need to apply for LCPC? I think the biggest question would be total number of hours. And the supervision, I'm 99% sure, is a non-issue. It's really going to depend on the total number of hours. It might be helpful 
for you to look at the supervision pages in the LTPT application to see where your direct hours, your group, your supervision fall out. And then again, you can always submit paperwork or contact the executive director and ask. And I guess uh, in terms of like submitting paperwork, can I do that? Should I start that now? Could I do that now? You can if you're applying on the basis of a master's. You can't if you're applying on the basis of the doctoral program. Okay, that's, that answers my question. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. There's another question somewhere.
And that's why taking it in October of 2014, and you're not correct, until July of 2015, potentially, yeah. it's early. And it's, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. And those are set dates, no flexibility by NBCC. If you do it through the state directly, it's offered once the first two full weeks of every month at various H&R block locations, postmasters. So how does that impact getting a job when we don't physically pack your license sure. until maybe that, that spring? Well, I think I think you might have heard a little bit of this from Joyce, but I'll, and I'd love for you to, but what I'm going to ask you, nobody in the state of Illinois can get a counseling license any earlier than a master's degree and then applying and taking the exam. So the reality is I think most folks in your profession, and I think Tracy can attest to this both as an employer but also as a counselor, and that is that there should be no surprise. What they're going to look to you for is are you in process? Have you taken the steps? Are you managing? initial license, even though it's somewhat temporary in your mindset, right? Because we want you to get to the LCPC, but it, it's an official license. So it's a compliment to you in Illinois, but you know, you're not all going to necessarily stay here. You're not all going to live for the rest of your life. But just keep in mind that if you're going to be here for a period of time, it allows you to take this exam and have an initial license, which tends to be well received. So with an LPC in Illinois, as long as you are receiving supervision, you may also use volunteer hours towards your LPPC hours, right? So it's something that is also another, I, I tend to find as I've looked at a lot of states, and I tend to be somewhat flexible, supportive, generous. Uh, and I think, you know, again, not that all of you, I mean, you know, you don't have to stay here, but it's something that you might consider getting started here because you've got some things in your kind of in your backpack, right? Yeah. Volunteering is a little different. So, you know, you must be an employee, pre-LPC and post-LPC, and you, or you might be a volunteer post-LPC, provided you're still receiving supervision. It could be in different, multiple. Nobody says you can't have two volunteer jobs and two part-time jobs. Nobody says you can't have a full-time and a volunteer. But because your employment clock, those hours start clicking, kind of post-master's conferral, then those, you might add, you know, not everybody's going to have a job. If, you grab, if you're finishing, you know, July 26th, you're not going to necessarily start a job July 27th. It would be great if some of you do, and hopefully you will. But that doesn't always work out that way. So what they're also saying is once you have your LPC, if, you, if it took you a couple weeks or a month or two to get that job, you might be, it's not going to be a whole two years, right? It's going to take you longer, which is fine. It can always take you longer. But you can complement those employment hours, part-time or full-time, with volunteer hours. Provided, and supervision can be one supervisor, you know, that's giving you supervision over the volunteer and the employment, provided that you all agree to that. Once you have your LPC, 
that's fine too. Yes, but you're tracking it, right? So you will need proof from each supervisor and signature signatures appropriately, and the volunteer, which can only begin post LCD. That's unfair because of license. In your hand, Illinois doesn't consider you an LPC until you've received a license and a number, right? You'll have this little. So all the hours you work before you actually have your license count for your full hours. Employment hours. Okay. So With supervision. October or whatever, yeah. Yeah. They count provided you receive supervision and provided you're tracking them, right? So there are hours No. They they're not considered volunteer hours. They're not I think in, in the side view situation you really have to read the code tied to what if you're if you're applying based on this ID or freeze ID with masters. It's a very it's very clearly articulated but it's a bit confusing. So I think it's important that we have that conversation while looking at the code. I would recommend before talking to Dan and getting very specific details because practicum hours are not considered volunteer because of training. Yeah, so you have the situation with your your licensure and then talking with Dan, talking with Aisha, making sure you've got your back in the room. But otherwise knowing your timeline, looking at these flow charts, putting a timeline in your calendars and your agenda, having a buddy who's in the same situation and making sure that you're on target with it. Um, I think it's you know important and just knowing that you're gonna get through it. I know it feels really overwhelming. You will get through it. You will have your license, you will have a job, it will go well, you will have a successful career. You know, otherwise there'd be all these people wandering around. You know, <laughs> 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 you will do well. And just the trust in that process that you never want to you know, tolerate this wave and, and have faith that um, things will work out the way that they do. I really do believe in um, kind of having a vision, so even making a vision board of how you want your profession to go and saving time and um, thinking and thinking positively and not thinking in a fear based way. And if there's anything that I can do to help you, feel so free, free to reach out. Um, and I hope that it's you at some of the impact events that I appreciate your coming here. Thank you so much, Joy. Thank you very much for all of your time. Uh, please make sure you grab the handout, leave an email if you can. Um, and I want to make one comment about the site. It's really unique that they allow you to do this. Most psychology and counseling do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm fine in that. Um, so can I, okay, so I understand that I can first, I grab, or I get my bachelor's in July. Do I have to, yeah, yeah I'm a second year, so do I have to actually get, have my math, or I have to actually get so my in hand?